Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to make a very brief introduction of Professor Eli Yablonovich, who actually doesn't need introduction. Everybody, many people know him. But I'll just uh, mention a few uh, uh, very impactful discoveries that uh, he, he made during his career. So he introduced the idea of strained semiconductor laser uh, that will have superior performance due to reduced valence band hole or effective mass with almost every human interaction with the internet, optical te telecommunication occurs with strained semiconductor lasers. So uh, that discoveries, I usually say optics is hidden somewhere. And that's one of the examples of uh, hidden sources that are being used to communicate. Uh, he is uh, regarded as uh, the father of photonic band gap uh, concept, and he coined the term photonic crystal. The geometrical structure of the first experimentally realized photonic band gap is sometimes called Yablonovite, and uh, that actually triggered the field, what, whatever it's called, metamaterials and uh, so on. Uh, in his photovoltaics research, he introduced the 4n squared Yablonovich limit, light trapping factor that is a worldwide use for almost all commercial solar panels. Uh, he is a member of National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, NAI, American ACR Sciences, and as a foreign member of UK Royal Society. Uh, he will present us the talk on uh, carbon dioxide removal technology to solve the climate crisis. crisis. As you notice, it's uh, not quite in the optics field, but uh, he's a very smart man, so we'll, we'll uh, listen what he has to, to, to convince us. Okay. Thank you very Eli, much. You are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will, I will also, uh, what, what will happen in passing, I'll explain how I got into this. Okay, so we've, uh, uh, we've all heard about the climate crisis, and I'm going to describe uh, a, an approach that I think uh, would solve the climate crisis at a reasonable cost, and so let's just get into it. Uh, now, it used to be, have we heard enough about the climate crisis? Yes, we, it's, it's almost uh, uh, assumed that, uh, uh, that you know about this. Now, um, about six, seven years ago, the, uh, the uh, idea for solving the climate crisis was to be carbon neutral. And, uh, but in reality, we can't simply be carbon neutral because there are su certain functions where we'll always be burning hydrocarbon fuel. And so what emerged about five years ago, which I'll show you, is the idea that uh, we actually have to be carbon negative. We have to have carbon dioxide removal. And, and uh, I was on an American Physical Society committee, and I said, we must start thinking about carbon negative. I said, oh, no, no, they, it, it was too controversial to go that far. Uh, but now it's, um, it's recognized as being needed, and one of the reasons it's needed is for international aviation. So here's an interesting fact uh, about uh, a trip. Let's say you're taking a trip to Europe or to Asia. So that's a long trip, right? The amount of fuel that's going to be burned is um, twice your personal weight. So I don't want to get personal asking you what your weight is, but whatever it is, you multiply by two and, and kilograms, and that's the number of kilograms of uh, jet fuel that you're going to burn. And so we need that because we, uh, we need to have a very uh, uh, a high energy to mass ratio to undertake these very long uh, flights. So that for that, we, need, we, need to, we will continue uh, burning fuel. And then another reason we need to continue to burn fuel is for summer, winter energy storage. And uh, when, we, uh, for example, in the Northeast, they, they have the heating oil, they produce it during the summer, and they fill these gigantic tanks uh, that are uh, all along uh, the, the flight path of airplanes landing at 
Newark Airport. There are hundreds of these giant tanks, and uh, they store a huge amount of energy, uh, yet they, they, it's so efficient that it only adds one or two cents a gallon uh, for the storage. And, th and these are things that are uh, tanks that are used once a year. So you have to have a rock bottom cost, and, uh, it, and that works out. So uh, uh, we don't have a solution to the energy storage problem other than uh, hydrocarbon fuels. And then there's going to be another uh, problem out there, and that is the countries that do not cooperate. What do you do about countries that do not cooperate? Well, uh, you're, you're going to end up pulling their carbon dioxide out of the air, too. And uh, so if you don't do that, the carbon in the atmosphere will grow, and we have to extract it. And then there's a sort of fourth reason, which is a little more uh, speculative, is that there are some climate models where positive feedback of CO2 from uh, permafrost, which is the uh, ice up in the uh, uh, northern and southern latitudes, uh, that uh, it's starting to melt, and there will be a thermal runaway, and will release uh, oxygen, maybe also methane. And so we may be in a position where we have to not only pull out this year's carbon dioxide, but pull out the carbon dioxide from prior years. And uh, so uh, uh, carbon neutral is not enough. I don't think it's controversial anymore, but as recently as five years ago, it was controversial that carbon neutral was not going to be enough. So what happened is that uh, the various national academies, uh, they started uh, writing reports on how, uh, how important this is. So this is uh, American National Academy of Sciences, carbon dioxide removal, and the corresponding European society, and they actually used the word negative. I always try to be very careful to, uh, in using the word negative, but they used it. And they said, we need negative emission technologies and ended up appearing in uh, magazines like uh, Physics Today. Uh, this is kind of an interesting picture because it shows what's probably the wrong thing to do. And that is, uh, the, you see these pipes? They actually want to tr uh, transmit the atmosphere of the Earth through pipes. And you can imagine that this is not going to be uh, very cheap to do. So uh, that's, that's one of the uh, sort of n not very good ideas. Uh, so nonetheless, that idea of direct air capture, it is a, it's an important strategy. At least it's important to the government. The, go the government uh, about a month ago committed $1.2 billion to pass the atmosphere through pipes, uh, capture the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, with uh, amines. This is just a chemical compound that uh, binds to carbon dioxide and uh, then recycle everything. So. It's, uh, and, and what is the cost? $600, actually the, our government is paying $1,000 a ton of CO2, so it's, it's quite expensive. Okay, so you think with all these reports that um, every possibility has already been examined. And let me show you the suggestions or, that were analyzed in the European report. Uh, manipulating the forests, okay. Um, uh, paying farmers to change their farming methods so that more, more of the roots stay in the soil, uh, burning the uh, plant matter and capturing the smoke and, uh, and piping it, uh, pumping it underground. Um, here's one that's kind of interesting. There are rocks uh, which actually, they're, they're silicates, but they actually absorb carbon dioxide. But the kinetics is extremely slow and um, it, it's quite limited in its uh, usefulness. Uh, then there's the direct air capture, uh, which is where you pass the atmosphere through pipes. And then another exotic idea, fertilize the ocean so you create a lot of algae. Okay, so these are all, uh, some of them are normal ideas, some of them are uh, speculative, exotic ideas, but the most obvious idea was not included in the report. Somehow it was overlooked, and that is the safe burial of agricultural biomass which we call agro-sequestration. Now, uh, that, I'm going to show you that's actually a pretty good approach. And uh, who first thought of it? So it was this guy, Freeman Dyson, who in the latter years of his life was a professor here at uh, UCSD. And, uh, but he was so early in this uh, that he, in 1976 he already wrote a paper uh, saying, yes, we can control carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, and it's not like he's not, he's like an incredibly famous, one of the 
the most creative physicist of the 20th century. And um, somehow uh, his suggestion was overlooked. And uh, so, but it was, a, it was a pretty good suggestion. He wanted to uh, grow trees, cut the trees down, bury them, and then he didn't realize that if you bury trees, they, um, they eventually decompose and you get the carbon dioxide back. So, but it was uh, still, uh, it was, he was thinking along the right uh, lines. Uh, and in fact, uh, for carbon dioxide removal, there is now a prize. It's a $50 million first prize, an X prize, uh, for the best way of doing this. And uh, so uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, now, I should, the bottom half of the slide is a little bit more scientific, and it states one of the big problems. Carbon dioxide is present in a very low concentration, and it takes energy to, uh, free energy, to, to boost the concentration. Because when you boost the concentration of a compound, the entropy goes down. And so you've got to pay for that somehow. And in fact, if you go from the density of carbon in the air to the uh, density uh, in the plant, uh, you're increasing uh, uh, the density of the carbon by eight orders of magnitude. So you've got to pay a price for that. Uh, the entropy, uh, you can take the natural log. So it's very easy to calculate the entropy. It's uh, natural log of the concentration ratio. And, uh, and th this is the entropy just of concentrating the carbon dioxide. Uh, now, uh, then you can convert that to energy, and it comes out to be close to half a volt per molecule. And in practice, of course, it's more because the plants are not 100% efficient. And so, and so where does the energy come from? The plants are using solar energy, and they are providing the energy to concentrate the uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, that's what you're up against. Now, it happened about 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was a, um, uh, um, a rush toward biofuels. Uh, maybe at that time they thought we were running out of fuel and they didn't know about uh, uh, fracking and, and all the other things. So um, they, they thought that maybe we need to grow the plants to make biofuel. So uh, they did a tremendous amount of research that is extremely helpful in, uh, in this talk because uh, Any time I talk about what is the productivity of the land, they figured it out. What is the cost of the agriculture, they figured the whole thing out, and, and uh, many other things. So they have already done much of the research work for us. And w one of the things they decided, what is the best crop in every climate? So in the Midwest, it's this uh, strange crop called miscanthus. In Florida, it's some kind of weird grass. Well, it doesn't look like grass. Uh, in Mexico, it's a different thing. Even in England, which is very far north, but still they have agriculture. And uh, so they could do this. They, these are the biofuel crops. What distinguishes them is that they are not food for insects because insects don't like to eat uh, uh, cellulose. Uh, whereas, let's say you grow corn. Yeah, insects like to eat corn. So you have to do, do insecticides and it's much harder to grow. Plus. Uh, uh, being easier to grow, they actually get more yield. So that's one of the things we need to know, is uh, how much carbon are we going to pull out of the air? It depends on how many tons of biomass you can get from an acre of land, or if you're in the metric system, from a hectare of land. So these are some of these crops that were identified by all the biofuel research, uh, elephant grass, other kinds of things. Now, uh, what's nice about them is they are more productive, and uh, you can get uh, tons and tons of cellulose per acre. That's, that's kind of amazing. But an acre, acre is actually quite a lot of land. But you can, you can get up to 20 tons of cellulose per year. And it's more productive by about a factor three than a food crop like maize. So pardon me for using the European term for corn. So they, for corn means something else in Europe. Uh, and uh, so for corn, what we call corn, they call maize. Okay, and, and, may, and it's, a, it's quite an efficient crop, uh, actually. Uh, growing uh, corn is about 2% efficient. So I got into this business through solar energy. I was a solar cell researcher, and I'll tell you that story next. Okay, but basically, uh, you could pull out all of the annual carbon dioxide in the air. You could pull it out, and, but it would be a large farming enterprise but not unprecedented. It's, it would be a very important cash crop for farmers 
if you did this. So uh, this is how I got into this field. Uh, I was working on solar cells, and uh, it was, uh, uh, we, we had people who had retired from RCA. So Al Rose, a very important person in history. Now the young people don't even know what RCA is. RCA is the company that created radio. They created radio commercials, which is already a significant business concept. Uh, they created black and white television, then they created color television. So it was a fantastic company. Now, uh, it just so happens that uh, Al Rose, he graduated in 1938, and he was recruited uh, to help make television into reality. And uh, very quickly, one of his first things was to invent the Viticon camera. And the Viticon camera was the camera for television from 1940 to 1980. And so when men walked on the moon, uh, they were not using charge couple devices. They were not using uh, modern cameras at all. They were using Viticons. It's part of the reason why the pictures are not that great. So he, he comes to me, and, I, and he's sort of like my mentor, and he says, uh, go out and, uh, well, uh, you, uh, you came here by car, you passed some gasoline stations, and uh, you know the price of gasoline is very high right now, and so figure out how many dollars per megajoule in the gasoline. And then he said, I want you to do one more thing. Go, get the Wall Street Journal and figure out on the Chicago Board of Trade what are they paying for corn uh, and uh, then how much energy is there in corn. So this is a bit of a challenge. So I, I, went, I did what he said, and, uh, and I was very shocked at the result. The result was that per megajoule, the price of energy in corn is roughly as the price of energy in gasoline. So I was very shocked at that. Of course, he was teasing me a little bit because he had already published this, and he didn't tell me, okay? And, and so since that time, I have had tremendous respect for agriculture, for the power of, and efficiency of agriculture. So what are we gonna do with all this biomass? We're not gonna make fuel out of it. We're gonna bury it, and uh, we're going to put it into an environmental chamber, and the chamber is uh, protected is lined with four millimeters of polyethylene, which is very thick plastic, and the plastic is going to keep uh, water out. And as long as we keep the biomass dry, that's I'm giving you the punchline of the talk. The new feature that has not been uh, 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 sort of assimilated in this field yet is that you can make the biomass last forever if you keep it dry, and that that's uh, the new feature. Okay, so we published a paper on this and uh, it's available online if you want it. The, the way to find it is uh, my co-author has a simple name, Deckman, and then if you get some approximation of my spelling correct, uh, then Google will find it for you. Okay, now uh, what about biofuel? So what do you get when you, in agriculture? You get something with a chemical formula of cellulose, which is approximately uh, this chemical formula. Okay, now if you look at this chemical formula, the carbon is already half oxidized. There's already one oxygen on the carbon, so it's half oxidized. Now if you try to make this into fuel, uh, you are, uh, your feedstock is already half oxidized. So to make one acre of fuel, of biofuel, you need two acres of farming because uh, the, uh, what you're producing is, uh, is already half used up. So, uh, biomass starts out as half oxidized, so you need, you need twice as much agriculture. Versus simply burying the biomass, you bury the entire carbon, when, uh, and, and you bury it, and you need half as much farming. So that, that's uh, an important thing, and would steer us in, in, that, in, the direction, in that direction, uh, and a little bit away from making biofuel. So uh, what happens if you um, just go ahead and toss the stuff in the ground. Well, there are, and le let's say you're clever and you say you're going to block oxygen because the, there are clays that you can use that block oxygen. And it'll be anaerobic, but unfortunately there are microbes that do not need oxygen. And they, they will, uh, they will uh, uh, cause the, uh, uh, the biomass to decay. And nonetheless, there are about uh, at least seven that I know of, of, of startup companies that are doing exactly this. And I, and I object because you put the wood in the ground and over the next few decades, it, it's gonna come back as CO2 and methane, which is even worse than CO2. 
So the insects and the fungi will um, uh, defeat that scheme. And so this is the idea that simple burial doesn't work. And uh, uh, the cellulose, it has this formula, and that formula just turns into CO2 and methane. So uh, both greenhouse gases. Uh, so, but sometimes people point to me, they've been to a museum, and they saw some, something made out of uh, wood, uh, like an old wooden ship that was somewhat, uh, it was uh, brought up from uh, the mud at the uh, bottom of the ocean. And uh, they say, well, it's still there. So wh what's the problem? So here's the problem. When you have wood, it's 70% cellulose, approximately, and 30% lignin. And lignin gives you the nice grain of the wood. I see I have a nice podium here made of wood, and there's a grain. And that's the uh, lignin part. It gives you that very colorful grain. Now, uh, the, uh, but what happens is that the microbes can easily digest cellulose. Okay. But lignin is very hard to have any chemical reaction. In fact, this is one of the problems in biofuel is that they can't use the lignin. So it presents a big problem for them. So what ends up happening is that the, uh, the cellulose decays and uh, the lignin stays behind and you think you have a board. So those of us who are homeowners, we occasionally, we plant, we want to do some gardening in the backyard, we dig it up and we find there's an old board there that was left by the contractors who were built the house. They were too lazy to, to dispose of, of the waste product, so they just uh, tossed it in the backyard. And you find an old board, and it looks like a board. It has the right shape, but when you pick it up, it doesn't have the mass of a board. It's very, very lightweight. And the reason is that uh, most of the weight is gone, but the lignin remains behind and gives you the, uh, uh, gives you the appearance of that you have wood, but actually, uh, you, you only have 30% of it. So uh, the point about this is that if you simply bury uh, wood and other things, uh, it's still useful because you'll end up sequestering about 30% of the weight. But that completely messes up the economics if you only uh, have 30% sequestration. So uh, we have to solve the problem. So let me uh, solve the problem. So this is the scientific part. The scientific part is I'm going to introduce a new concept called water activity. So uh, the, um, the basic idea is we have to keep the biomass dry. So what is water activity? So everybody here is familiar with relative humidity. Okay, it's part of the weather forecast. Uh, not so much in California because we have a nice dry climate, but uh, back east. Now, uh, what if someone would ask, what is the relative humidity of the stake? That would not be appropriate. But if they ask, what is the water activity of the stake, that is actually uh, very meaningful. And, uh, and uh, we uh, generally, uh, uh, we, uh, we, it's, a, it's actually an important question. Uh, let's say we dry the meat, and the meat is very dry, then it's going to have a low water activity. So water activity is, it has the same meaning as relative humidity, but as applied to solid materials. Uh, now, uh, here's the important uh, part of what we're introducing, is that... Um, uh, when biomass is very dry, uh, it will not decompose. Okay? And in fact, metabolic activity comes to a stop at less than 60% water activity, which is equivalent to 60% relative humidity. So, and the reason is that the uh, microbes, they need a little bit of water to move the nutrients around the, their cells, and uh, when it gets too dry, the metabolism stops. So uh, this is sort of a, a picture. I have here a picture uh, illustrating. This is well known to the Native Americans from the Pacific Northwest. They would catch salmon, and they would dry the salmon. So this is like a large uh, number of salmons that are waiting, uh, that are drying out. And, and this uh, was a standard practice uh, for them. So that's dryness. That's a new feature. Now, how dry does it have to be? So many bacteria require 95% uh, relative humidity or, or water activity. And then yeast can get by at 85%, mildews maybe 80%. And as you go down in percentage, fewer and fewer things survive. And uh, finally, uh, at 60% water activity, metabolism comes to a stop. Now, who has studied this? Uh, it turns out two government agencies have studied this. 
the Food and Drug Administration. So let's say you want to put a product on the shelf of a supermarket. Uh, the, the guy from the Food and Drug Administration will ask you, what is the water activity in your food? And you say, well, the water activity is uh, 50%. And say, okay, it's less than 60%, wrap it in cellophane and put it on the shelf. It's safe to put on the shelf. But if it were over 60%, he would say, no, it's not safe. Okay. Now, the other government agency that studied this is NASA. NASA is interested in life on other planets. How much water do you need to have life on other planets? So they studied this in great detail, arrived at the same conclusion, okay, that at 60% uh, uh, water activity or 60% relative humidity, uh, the um, metabolism stops. So this is very useful to us because the schemes that are out there for uh, sequestering uh, biomass, uh, they are generally very damp, very wet, and they won't last very long. Okay, so how much water is that? So I'll ju this is a chart for different uh, forms of biomass, uh, and I can tell you the conclusion of the chart. Uh, you want to stay on the horizontal axis, you have water activity, so you want to stay below 60% uh, water activity, and that usually means about 10 to 14% let me just draw a horizontal line here, 10 to 14 percent by weight water. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, the, uh, when, you, when a farmer sells corn to the Chicago Board of Trade, they don't want to pay for the water. So they say, if you bring us corn, it better have less than 14 percent water in it. And that actually is uh, very wise because at that point, uh, the corn will not uh, decompose. You'll be able to ship it around and uh, make some money. Okay, so we end up with these uh, environmental chambers that are kept dry by being sealed in by very thick uh, polyethylene. Now, people ask, well, uh, the, you, how much land is this going to take up? And uh, it's very small. If you have 10,000 acres of agriculture, you can capture uh, all of the biomass into uh, one acre of this environmental chamber. And the reason is partly because it's, uh, it's kind of deep. It's uh, maybe uh, 30 meters deep, 100 feet deep. Uh, but you're not really uh, preventing the land from being reused for agriculture, because then you put more dirt on top, and it becomes good agricultural land once again. Now, what about the uh, polyethylene seal? So water does not like to diffuse through polyethylene. Uh, and uh, you can figure out that people have done many uh, measurements of the diffusivity of water through polyethylene, and it works out to be less than two microns of water equivalent, of liquid equ equivalent liquid water uh, uh, per year. And given the, the thickness that we're talking about, uh, the, it could easily accommodate the, the two microns equivalent of water, and uh, this biomass will stay dry for thousands of years. So that, that's the uh, concept. So can it solve the problem? So I have here a bunch of things, how, many, how much petroleum, we're burn, how much coal, how much natural gas. It works out that if you can uh, deal with 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide, uh, you, you would essentially be solving the problem. So you have to sequester 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So how to do that? Well. Uh, this was already analyzed for us by the biofuel people because they were busy identifying where, where we grow, what we grow, etc. And so these, this is uh, one of the papers uh, on uh, where you get, you get the farmland and it's yet another uh, one from the Department of Energy, a uh, billion ton report, etc. And uh, so they did all the work for us to figure this out, but it's all cond condensed onto this slide. So the, this bar represents all the land area of the Earth. Okay, and uh, some of it is covered in ice, uh, some of it is uh, hopeless for other reasons, maybe it's at the top of a mountain or in the Himalayas. And then there's the part that's more or less useful to human beings, agriculture, forestry, uh, maybe shrubs, maybe uh, cities and freshwater lakes. Okay, so uh, what do we actually use? Well, for the agricultural part, we use uh, this part, but most of it is pasture land for cattle. 
uh, 11% of the Earth's surface has row crops. So 11% of the Earth's surface looks like Iowa. Uh, it's just uh, row after row of, of crops. Now, how much land would we need uh, to sequester the 20 gigatons, which would solve the carbon dioxide problem? And it's represented by the blue rectangle. So uh, basically, uh, roughly speaking, so you take some percentage of the pasture land and you, you grow biomass. You don't disturb the food crops. One of the reasons you don't disturb the food crops is that the European Union has a law that you cannot uh, take uh, agricultural land and use it for uh, other purposes like this. So this blue rectangle represents the size of the problem. Okay. Now, how good are we at agriculture? We've been doing it for 10,000 years, and we keep doing it better and better. And uh, the biofuel crop is uh, non-food, so it does not need insecticides, it does not need as much of fertilizer, energy inputs, etc. Uh, so it's much easier to grow than food crops. And uh, so uh, what, what we can do is uh, look up uh, what do the farmers get paid? So you can look up, the farmers are paid per bushel at the Chicago Board of Trade. And then you can look up how many bushels are produced per acre. Then you, you can look up the price of the bushels. These are all things you can look up uh, in the Wall Street Journal. And finally, it comes out that the, uh, the farmers uh, need to be paid $500, roughly $500 an acre. That's what it costs a farmer to farm and then to allow for, for a profit. That includes also some profit for the farmer. Uh, so uh, that gives you an idea of how to calculate the uh, cost of the agriculture. But you can do it other ways as well, and you get it roughly the same price. You can uh, look up all the inputs and uh, so forth and look up, because the farmer has to, in principle, rent the land. You have to pay the, the, the rent. You can look the whole thing up. And uh, so if you can do it different ways. You end up with the same conclusion. The agriculture would cost about $30 a ton of CO2. So there it is. And uh, the environmental chamber would cost also roughly $30 a ton. So uh, the environmental chamber are very similar to the landfills, but it's a landfill in reverse in the sense that you're trying to keep the, the uh, biomass dry. So it's, it's not, you're not trying to keep the bad things in, you're trying to keep the water out. Okay. And uh, you can contract. There are companies that build landfills. And, you, and they build it with the four millimeters of polyethylene. And, and you, you can get the price. So the price is uh, uh, not much of an approximation. It's out there. You can contract for it. And so each one costs about $30 a ton. That includes all the shipping and so on. Of course, to get a low price like this, we have to build the landfill within the agricultural area because you don't want to have to uh, 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 move so many tons of biomass a very long distance. So it ends up to be $60 a ton. And then we've done this also for other crops that are popular, switchgrass, which is another biofuel crop. And this ty uh, type of pine tree is also um, very popular uh, for um, uh, biomass. And you can see that the differences in price are not very high. And it's uh, very reasonable in price. Okay. So since we don't go about our daily lives buying tons of CO2, we need to translate it to something we're more accustomed to. So $60 a ton of CO2, this is a, uh, uh, like a, a, a question on the advanced placement exam uh, for uh, high school students in chemistry. And uh, if it's $60 a ton of CO2, how many dollars per gallon? And it works out to be 53 cents a gallon of gasoline. So I think you would agree with me that this is, uh, it's, the world's not going to come to an end if the price of gas goes up 53 cents, because in California, it goes up and down like that all the time. Uh, and uh, now, how big is this problem? So we've got to uh, get rid of 20 gigatons of CO2 at $60 a ton. It ends up being a lot of money. It ends up being $1.2 trillion. But the world economy is $100 trillion. So it would, be, it would set back the world economy by 1.2%. And roughly speaking, the world economy uh, grows by productivity increases by 2%. So it would not be a huge thing, and it would be spread out over very many years. So now I have to tell you the, 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 uh, the, the very interesting part. Uh, so we sent the paper off for publication, 
And one of the referees said, well, it's, it's, a good, it's a good paper, but there's something missing. He says, you need to have an example, maybe a natural experiment, where you can prove that if you keep things dry, they will last a very long time. So I'm going to show you uh, an experiment, but it was not from nature. It was uh, an intentional experiment. You'll see what I mean. So this is a um, mesa in Israel. It's a very famous mesa. Uh, and it, you see it's um, very easily defended. It has uh, vertical walls, so they could defend it very easily. And indeed, this mesa is famous for being the last holdout of the Jewish zealots who were um, holding off the uh, Romans for three years. Okay, so it was a very defendable place. Now, King Herod was the uh, king uh, in the prior century, and uh, like all kings, he was afa afraid of being overthrown. That's why we have democracy today, is we, we, don't, we don't have kings. And uh, so he was afraid of being overthrown, so he builds himself a castle up here. These are the parts of the castle that he builds. And you can see with the vertical walls, it's very easy to defend. It's also an extremely remote location. It's also extremely dry. Uh, so you have uh, the Dead Sea down here, uh, uh, maybe 1,200 feet below sea level. And the top of the mesa is actually at sea level. So it's kind of a, an unusual location. It's a very, if, uh, one of the driest places in the world. And uh, then it is forgotten. Uh, it's very hard to get to. Uh, it's, uh, you have to climb these walls and, and these vertical walls and so forth. And so uh, the, uh, the ruins are left behind for 2,000 years. And then an archaeologist uh, goes and excavates the ruins and uh, finds something very interesting. So let me show you what that is. So this is uh, King Herod, maybe some kind of uh, sculpture of King Herod. That was uh, 2,000 years ago. And then in 1965, an Israeli archaeologist goes and excavates, and he publishes a bunch of archaeology papers. Okay, And he has some things that he finds. And what he finds are these seeds. And these seeds are the seeds for a very common tree in that climate. It's called the date palm tree. And he doesn't know what to do with them, so he leaves them in a, in a, in a drawer with the other archaeological treasures. And then he passes away. And a doctor in Jerusalem hears about this. And she says, uh, she persuades them to let her have some of those seeds. And she sends the seeds away to be carbon dated. Okay, and it comes back, the carbon dating comes back and says, yes, these seeds are 2,000 years old. And so then what she does uh, is she um, gives them to a horticulturalist and says, can you germinate these seeds? And she was able to germinate the seeds. And now in southern Israel, you have quite a few of these trees that were germinated around 2005, but from seeds that were already 2,000 years old. Okay, I think they have seven examples. So this is uh, one, uh, one example. And I'll show you a figure five from our paper. Uh, this is uh, an 18-year-old uh, date palm tree. Because of its historical and cultural significance, it has a wrought iron fence protecting it, so uh, it, it's uh, somewhat protected. It has a name, uh, appropriate name, Methuselah, being very old. And it was excavated from King Herod's palace, which is, what is it? It's, the palace was a cool, dry place. It was uh, not exposed to the sun it w or, or even to rain. They do have rain there, but it was uh, uh, in, uh, in some uh, excavated uh, location on, on uh, Masada. So uh, this is uh, kind of remarkable. This is the proof that we needed for the referee, is that if you have, uh, if you have a dry enough climate, uh, the, uh, the biomass will be preserved for thousands of years. So he was OK with that. So uh, I'm sort of coming to the end of the talk. Uh, and I forgot to ask you for questions. So we're, we're, it's a good time to start thinking about questions. Uh, let me show you some other interesting facts that we discovered when we did this. Is how good is agriculture? So uh, this is from 1960 to 2010. In the least developed countries, the productivity of the land for agriculture increased by two times. Okay? And this is, of course, been the history of the past 10,000 years. The agriculture is always getting better. 
Now, the uh, cost estimates I gave you were based on current agricultural costs, not on the future costs. But I have here a couple of slides what to expect in the future. And so uh, please expect a greater productivity from agriculture. So this is some data that we found which was quite remarkable. It gave the productivity of producing wheat in England, and the data went back to the 1700s. And all you had to do was change units, uh, because they didn't, back then they didn't even use acres. They used some other uh, uh, metric for uh, land area. But, so what we did, we plotted the productivity of wheat in England for 200 years to the present. What happened? At the, uh, so we start the graph at 1800. 1800 uh, in the early 1800s, Malthus comes along and he's a, uh, he's a famous guy because he said this industrial revolution is not going to work because there are going to be too many children and there won't be enough food. Okay? And uh, of course we laugh and he was, he was wrong. Uh, but uh, look at why he was wrong. First of all, from 1800 to 1900, the productivity of growing wheat in England doubled. Okay? Then from 1900 to 1950, what happened in 1900 was that the Haber process for converting uh, nitrogen in the air to ammonia, uh, the Haber process uh, was developed and we could make artificial fertilizer. And so the productivity of the land doubled from 1900 to 1950. And then from 1950 to 2000, it doubled again. So right now, the trajectory of agricultural productivity is, uh, it's a Moore's law. Uh, it's a slow Moore's law, it's, but it's a factor of two roughly every 50 years. Now, can we uh, expect this to continue? I would say yes, because of CRISPR technology. We're going to uh, have uh, better seeds and so on. And then uh, here in the, um, in the electrical engineering department and in many uh, universities, they're studying ways to put sensors on the land so the farmers can be a lot smarter about the application of fertilizer and uh, and that'll increase yields as well. And how much improvement is possible? So I'll, I'll give you an idea, is that uh, today, I, mentioned, I may have mentioned, corn is 2% efficient. They say the, the plant is established, it's the differential efficiency. You add a little bit more sunlight and you get uh, a little bit more uh, carbohydrate. And, and so the carbohydrate you can burn and uh, figure out how much energy is in there and uh, it's the most favorable conditions. It's still only, uh, uh, it's less than 2% efficiency for corn. Uh, the biofuel crop may be four or 5% efficient, okay? Uh, but the mechanism in photosynthesis is very similar to the mechanism in solar panels. And uh, the, um, you, you excite electron and hole and they get separated and so forth. It's very, very similar. So why is agriculture down at 2% or maybe 4%? and solar panels are at 29 percent. And uh, the, uh, I think the agriculture will catch up to the uh, solar panels. The solar panels are very close to the theoretical limit. Agriculture is well below the theoretical limit. And there's a an, uh, sort of an unanswered question. After 100 mi million years of evolution, why hasn't agriculture uh, gone up to the theoretical limit? And so that's a controversial topic. Here's another uh, fact about agriculture is that uh, we are getting more efficient. Because of that, we are using less land. So 1.5 billion acres of land are, not, are under, uh, underutilized for agriculture because we simply don't need it. Um, the world uh, uses 68% less land to produce the same amount of food. So that's, that's another interesting uh, fact. Okay, so we're going to have further improvements, Is that, uh, but I'm not using any of these further improvements in my cost estimates. So how do we say that we solve the climate crisis? We need something scalable, and agriculture is man mankind's, one of mankind's largest industries and oldest. Okay. Uh, can we get the cost down? Well, I would say 53 cents a gallon is quite reasonable, and 1.2% of the world uh, uh, economy is also uh, uh, reasonable and doable. Uh, now, there's another uh, question. And that has to do with stability. So there are many ideas. There are uh, at least, for example, for the X Prize, there are 100 different schemes. And some of them really weird. Okay? And uh, 
but they don't have proof, certainly over long periods of time. Uh, they, they might work, but it's sort of like, wow, that's a great idea. Come back in 2,000 years when you know for sure what happens. And there, there could be uh, environmental effects and so on. So you, you really have to be uh, quite certain. Um, uh, society needs predictability. Uh, and uh, we can't wait for hundreds of years to validate a, a particular approach. And so uh, it has to be pretty simple. The other thing is it's an urgent problem, so we need rapid implementation. The nice thing about uh, agro sequestration, we can start in April because April is going to be the next growing season. We can start pulling carbon out of the air. Uh, so uh, it, has, um, it has many of these uh, features. But I have to apologize is I'm a high-tech guy, but I'm offering a low-tech solution. Uh, and, but I, I feel comfortable with the low-tech solution because the world cannot take a chance. Um, and uh, the, we don't know how, how things will turn out in hundreds of years. And agro sequestration is essentially proven already for two millennia. So we, we have our experimental data. As far as the land is concerned, there are some shocking uh, things about uh, United States corn. United States is the world's uh, largest producer of corn by far, but 40% of American corn is used for ethanol, is, is uh, gasohol. And the gasohol is not a very good idea, and it's not carbon neutral, et cetera, et cetera. So you could imagine uh, you can get rid of the gasohol, and the farmers would be happy to switch to a better crop. Uh, 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 and it would be already you, you start with one quarter of the land area of Iowa. So the, uh, we, you could possibly go uh, quite uh, rapidly that way. Uh, so uh, now, uh, in any uh, project like this, you have to uh, see what are the political obstacles. But I would say uh, this would be uh, politically acceptable to farmers because it's a new cash crop. It's a new way for them to make money. And uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, I think uh, that would help the adoption. And uh, we know how influential the farmers in Iowa are. Okay, so uh, I would say that, uh, in fact, the, the, the scale could not just remove this year's carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide from previous years. You could actually scale it to that level. But I would say we have to avoid complacency, complacency because uh, there's a moral hazard. People say, oh, there's no problem. We can, uh, we can uh, stop doing research. No, 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 no. We have to continue research. We have to continue converse, uh, conservation, uh, alternative energy, decarbonization, other forms of sequestration. We need an all of the above approach. So uh, to do this, in my personal experience, if you really want to get something done, you have to start a company. So we have started a company, and we're calling it AgroCapture Corporation, and uh, it's just starting. So we're recruiting at all levels. If somebody is interested, you can um, email me uh, your resume. We're hiring at all levels, member of technical staff, all the way up to CEO. Uh, so please send uh, CVs to myself. And um, just to summarize, we're living with uncharted high concentrations of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, this is, this is a, a leftover slide for where, when people were afraid of uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal and, they, uh, car and carbon neutrality. So carbon neutrality is not enough now. And it leaves us exposed to danger. And uh, so uh, we, uh, the uh, agro sequestration can take care of the problem. And let me thank you for your attention and ask for uh, questions. And we have microphones set aside uh, for the uh, question period. So thank you very much. This is extremely enlightening talk, thank you. Uh, maybe I missed that. So how do we keep the plant, uh, f the, the, the low humidity the, to, to keep it dry to begin oh, with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to keep the, actually the, everything below the 60% water activity. Yeah, yeah. How do we do it? So let me explain how agriculture works. Uh, uh, the, um, the farmer cannot sell 
a, a damp crop. Uh, it won't. It won't. You can't ship it. It's, so uh, the the farmers in the United States are already drying the crops, and uh, they have had to dry the crops uh, at least since the beginning of agriculture in the mid Midwest, which was around the 1870s. And uh, so they always had to dry it. Now back in the 1870s, they would just leave it out, and they, the crop would dry and would be dry enough, just from uh, the sun shining on it. Uh, but uh, in these days. The farmers are using uh, propane or natural gas to dry the crop. Okay, and what we do in our calculations is we take into account all of the CO2 that's emitted during the whole process. And so, let's say we are sequestering 100 tons of CO2, but we have to burn uh, 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 five tons to uh, to do the drying, to do the agriculture, to run the uh, tractors and so on and so forth. So in our calculations, uh, it works out we have 95% efficiency. Uh, uh, that's to say that uh, we uh, sequester 100 tons, but uh, we emit uh, equivalent to uh, 5 tons of uh, CO2 while, uh, while doing that. And uh, so that's the method of drying is today they would use fuel, but you don't have to. You can just let the sun dry the crop. I see. So not just crop, but this technique to work, you also need to dry up the leaves and the stand and everything. Is yes, that yes. So you, you, you take the crop, you, and, and you, the, the farmers do this now. They have uh, in the fields, they have a, a machine, uh, not in the fields, but uh, at the farm, they have a machine that takes the uh, wet corn and dries it. And it it's just uh, a normal uh, farming practice now. It's a requirement. And uh, uh, so... Uh, the, and uh, the, there are, of course, many other factors. That was the 5% of inefficiency. Uh, is all the things we need to, uh, uh, to do. Uh, for example, uh, we, there's a price, there's a CO2 price for creating fertilizer. And so on. All, all those things add up to about 5%. Question up here. Thank you so much. Um, what do you see as the biggest hurdles going forward? Uh, that that's a good question. Uh, the um, I don't know what it's going to be. There are always going to be hurdles, and um, uh, there there are competitors. Uh, there are lots of competitors. Uh, there's a hundred different schemes. And uh, once you have competitors, they're not going to let go. And uh, so uh, those might be uh, issues. I'm, I'm very optimistic in the long term, but I see a lot of delays and obstacles. I can't imagine how you could uh, uh, eventually... Well, it's possible that somebody might come up with something that costs less than $60 a ton. So in, and in that case, I would be supremely happy and uh, that, uh, that that would be uh, the case. Uh, but uh, I think there's a, um, uh, a little bit of a mental block. Uh, people have treated this as a problem that cannot be solved. And if you go and say, well, it can be solved, there's going to be resistance because there's a big commitment to this being an unsolvable problem. I, I see that as a bit of an issue. The other thing, I've given this talk in Europe, and the, the answer I've received in Europe is, yes, it's wonderful, but uh, we're a very small country. We can't do all this agriculture, et cetera, so it's not for us, okay? And they don't, they have to, they have to internalize the idea that uh, they import fuel, they're going to have to import also carbon credits from other countries that have uh, a bigger agricultural enterprise. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit worrisome. No, no one can predict uh, how long it's going to take uh, for something like this to be accepted. Back here. Um, have you seen models of rather than sequestration actually utilizing CO2 for products? And does that make sense? Well, do it. Uh, yes, uh, the oil companies are especially interested in CO2, uh, not just because their business depends upon pulling it out of the atmosphere, but they have a use for it, and that is that in, um, uh, in fracking, in very advanced oil recovery schemes, uh, they will pump CO2 down into the oil well, 
uh, the CO2 will dissolve in the oil and change the surface tension. And when the surface tension changes, the oil can flow more easily through the narrow crevices in the, in the rocks, and they get more, uh, more petroleum that way. So they think of uh, CO2 being useful in that respect. But I regard uh, underground CO CO2 under pressure as being uh, somewhat of a hazard, because every now and then uh, the CO2 uh, uh, sort of catastrophically leaks out. And uh, there are examples historically where uh, uh, people were asphyxiated, not, not just individual people, but uh, uh, this happened in Africa in the 1980s, and uh, hundreds of villagers were asphyxiated uh, by the CO2 from a lake uh, bubbling up all at once. Uh, so I, I think uh, the, uh, uh, the pressurized CO2 may not be the best uh, solution environmentally, and it has a, an intrinsic hazard in that the, uh, the plumbing will eventually fail. Uh, can we guarantee plumbing for 2,000 years? I don't think so. So it's not something, uh, so I, I mean, it's going on, it's, uh, it's good, but nobody has costs as low as this. And uh, so they're willing to pay quite a bit for the CO2 because it's useful. Does this method have a possibility of catastrophic failure? Uh, and I have a completely different question, too, and that's, um, have you applied for the X Prize? Um, yeah, we did not apply to the X Prize because it was so bureaucratic and had so many preconditions. Uh, and that the judges, uh, I, I went, I got online and I listened to some speeches from the judges, and they all had like groupthink of the old concepts. And so I didn't think it was uh, worthwhile for us to uh, deal with their bureaucracy and all their rules. Now, uh, what happens if something goes wrong? That was the first part of your question. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea of one of the things that uh, people have complained about might go wrong. Uh, and of course, we, we have answers for this. But let's say uh, the, um, the uh, polyethylene uh, liner, let's say for some reason it breaks, maybe it wasn't made correctly, and so forth. Uh, so that, that would be bad. But it's not a, a catastrophe. Uh, but it does cost a little bit of money if that happens. Uh, in, in that you have to go and dig out the biomass, dry it, and then you have tens of years in which to do this because it's, it's not going to decompose right away. So you have to dry it and you have to rebury it. And uh, wh what's going to happen is that there are going to be uh, thousands of these individual uh, environmental chambers. So uh, let's say you lose one out of 10,000. It's, it's going to cost you some money uh, to fix it, but I, I wouldn't call it catastrophic. Hi. Um, so I have a couple of questions. The first is, uh, when you refer to pasture land, is that dedicate? Is that currently dedicated to, like, say, livestock, um, growing livestock? Uh, uh, that, that's true. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you you have to look at some of the other graphs I showed you. There's actually a, a lot of underutilized farmland today. So it's not going to be uh, just livestock or cattle farming. It's going to be uh, other uh, uh, other forms of agriculture, even the row crops, a lot of them have been abandoned because of the, uh, uh, the Moore's Law for Agriculture that increased the uh, productivity over the past century. Okay, so uh, so, so the, the question about land availability uh, uh, was worked out by the biofuel people. And I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the biofuel takes twice as much farming because of the uh, fact that the carbon is already half oxidized. Uh, so I, I don't think the land is going to be uh, that big a problem. And it's, in any case, it's been uh, worked out by others. Okay, in that case, um, for my second question, which is also about land allocation, but it's more in terms of the time scale. So when you're estimating the total amount of land that you're going to be able to allocate towards these, you know, what would be biofuel feedstocks, I guess, um, how long do you think it would take to reach sort of the maximum threshold for that land that you're allocating towards? You mean how long would it take to really get going? Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned that we could get started in April, uh, and the farmers do change their uh, crop every year, so they could do it very quickly. But uh, we're talking about also introducing new farmland, uh, maybe changing it over from ranch land to uh, farmland. 
and then you have to build roads, you have to build more infrastructure, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, your estimate is as good as mine. Uh, how long would it take uh, to uh, build the roads, the new infrastructure, uh, the, uh, uh, maybe uh, the utilities you need, and so forth? Uh, so uh, that, uh, uh, you could estimate that you could get that going in about 10 years. Uh, you know, the Midwest was settled in a relatively short period, uh, starting from nothing. Uh, and uh, so the settlement, uh, a lot of it took place during the 1870s. So a 10-year period seems to be a reasonable period to take land from one use, to br uh, or not even use at all, but to bring it into uh, useful farming. I also had another question to elaborate on that, but I can ask you later. <laughs> okay, there, there might be some people waiting, yeah. Sure, so I had a question about, uh, uh, did you, did you run numbers with some other kinds of crops that are also capable of producing yes. food, right? So maybe not quite as efficient, but at the same time uh, produces some food for... No, we haven't looked at food crops. Um, and the, the rationale is that uh, we need the highest productivity, and that comes from non-food crops. The high productivity to us is just tons of biomass. And uh, so we didn't look at food. I think I tried to show some slides at the end that... Uh, you know, food is not the problem that it was uh, 200 years ago. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, surplus of, of food to the extent that a lot of farmland has been, is underutilized now. Uh, just to give an example, in New England, uh, used to be farms all through New England. It's not the greatest location for agriculture, though. And uh, many of those farms have been turned into feedlots. And I'm Canadian. And the land, the agriculture is even tougher in Canada. And I go back, I'm kind of old, so I, can, I remember what it was like when I was a kid. And I said, gee, where did this forest come from? This used to be a farm. And uh, so uh, the, uh, a lot of agricultural land uh, is being converted to uh, lesser purposes. So I don't see that we have a food problem. Yeah, I'm just thinking of other parts of the world uh, where there might be subsistence farmers who rely on the food supply and don't yeah. want to be yeah. dependent so, on someone else selling them food at a price that, they can. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, one of the principles is we're, uh, just like in Europe, we are not going to touch land that is being used for food. On the other hand, uh, those uh, subsistence farmers are getting smarter and more productive every year. I showed an example from the uh, least developed countries. They have doubled their productivity. Uh, so uh, the... Um, they may welcome a cash crop, a, a, new, a new way to make money. And in fact, the way to think about it is that uh, if you pull out the CO2 on the other side of the Earth, it doesn't matter if you pull it out in the United States or on the other side of the Earth, the atmosphere, we all share the atmosphere. And so uh, you, you see that uh, there, there are going to be uh, uh, certainly some farmers who look upon this as a, as a great new opportunity. So if you looked at like corn they're growing now, do they don't use all of the corn plant, right? They we eat just a small part of it. Yeah. If you bury the rest of it, I mean, could you just take the much of what we already grow for food that's not used and bury that? Yes, at it's least true. as a way to start. It's true. Uh, the farmers though they don't like to uh, uh, give away the, the that part. They leave it on the ground. They think it helps the uh, uh, the crop. Uh, the um, the way to think about it is that there are probably a lot of little niches where you can get a lower cost than what we're describing. But my goal was to show not just that we can do a niche solution that uh, might make a few dollars, but that we could actually uh, uh, deal with the entire problem. But there, without a doubt, there are going to be clever people. They find some, some little thing. It's not scalable, but it could be worth a lot of money if you do it that way. And uh, so uh, I'm all in favor of that. In fact, we're completely agnostic with regard to the crop. In the sense, if you, if you have a source of biomass that's different, by all means, use that biomass. And uh, of course, you're going to have to dry it and so on, but uh, the, uh, we're, we're agnostic. You can use any kind of biomass you want in this approach. And uh, all these assumptions are, are 
based on what we're doing now in terms. So it in, somewhat improves if we can start to go to more renewable energy, you know, can cut down our fossil fuel use. It's all for the better, right? Yeah, I, th this is the, the reason why I'm not in favor of a carbon tax. Uh, I'm in favor of a carbon mandate. So you tell people you put a kilogram of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you've got to take a kilo kilogram back out. Okay, and the, and the reason I like that is exactly for the reason you're mentioning, is that with time, the cost will go down and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll all benefit from that. Whereas uh, I don't see many examples where taxes go down. And uh, the other advantage of this is that it doesn't, the money, the carbon tax could be going for a completely different purpose. And if you have a mandate, you have to take that carbon dioxide back out of the air. So uh, the, uh, there are big advantages in what you just mentioned. I had a simple question. Some of the agriculture, at least in the United States, is subsidized by the government. Who is going to pay for uh, that, that uh, biofuel? Uh, yeah. Or, and the second part yeah. uh, is, uh, how do you make other countries uh, cooperate? Okay, so uh, those are both excellent uh, questions. And um, uh, let's see, the, the first question was, uh, uh, how do you survive without uh, subsidies? Okay, so uh, with the uh, concept that I have in mind, which is a, a mandate rather than a tax, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, the, uh, uh, the people who, for example, there are a few big companies that produce the oil. They said, well, your oil is going to get burned, and so you have to pull that carbon dioxide out of the air. Okay, and so uh, they, they will have to pay what it costs to, they have to show that they pulled that much carbon dioxide out of the air. And uh, as far as the farmers are concerned, you could buy the crop from them, and there could be a separate company that uh, uh, runs the uh, environmental chamber and, and uh, safely uh, buries it. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's one, uh, one way of doing the cost and would work very well in the developed countries where the legal system is very strong and uh, you could have a mandate and you can enforce the uh, mandate. Now, uh, the other problem is how to deal with other countries that don't cooperate. So I've given that a little bit of thought. And uh, the, I had a slide at the beginning. With other countries that don't cooperate, you, you might have to just pull their carbon dioxide out of the air and then send them, uh, send them a bill or something. But uh, the, uh, uh, when it comes to petroleum that is shipped on the seas by uh, companies, then you have a lot of control over those companies. And so uh, that's a good portion of the world's uh, hydrocarbon energy. But there are going to be countries like Russia that uh, ship the oil through pipelines, let's say, to China, which is happening right now as a result of the Ukraine war. That's what I meant. Yeah. And, uh, and that, uh, you don't have much control over those, those people. And uh, so I think uh, the, uh, uh, there's still a need for governmental cooperation, but uh, it, it's, war upsets everything, doesn't it? And, uh, and uh, war damages everything. War, war damages the atmosphere. So I don't have an answer to war. But I would, I would say my best answer was it may not be that as big a problem yeah. as, as we have today. You can tax all the generators. Uh, yeah, 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 pollution. yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. On the same uh, line of questions, uh, yeah. do you envision a way that you're going to guarantee that the carbon that you are burning and the amount of tons of carbon that you're burning um, is the real number? Because we've seen that there are a lot of problems with the carbon credit and carbon market. Yeah. So how do you envision this enforcement? Uh, you know, I think uh, the, um, the, right now a number of private companies have declared themselves to be certifiers. And no one gave them a license to be certifiers, okay? But we have many things in society you need to have a license. For example, if you want to be a doctor, you need a license. Uh, and uh, there, even a taxi driver has to have a license. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, one possible structure is that you still have the private certification companies that go and inspect and so forth, but uh, they, are, uh, they are licensed by the government to make sure they're doing an honest job. And, uh, but there will always be uh, some people who cheat. 
and, and uh, uh, how to deal with that is, uh, uh, is still an important question. So it's a good question. Hi, Professor. I have a question, a more technical um, question. It's about um, the wrap, plastic wrap that you use to hold um, yeah. the um, dry biomass. Yes. How does it uh, withstand uh, you know, long-term um, storage? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the, um, um, this is a high-density polyethylene. It's very durable, but how long will it last? So there are similar uh, hydrocarbon, similar plastics that are used in, um, in roof shingles. Now roof shingles are a very tough application because it, the sun is beating down on it and that oxidizes uh, the, um, uh, the polyethylene. Uh, the, uh, but we're going to keep the polyethylene underground. And so there won't be any ultraviolet light. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a program, uh, an environmental program, uh, to get rid of the forever plastics. They call them forever plastics. And the way they, uh, so they want the plastics to be biodegradable. We don't want our plastic to be biodegradable. So let me tell you how they make the plastic biodegradable. They put in oxygen. And when you put in oxygen, it becomes like a carbohydrate and, and the, uh, 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 the bugs, the microbes can eat that type of plastic. And we're doing the exact opposite. Uh, we have pure polyethylene, there's no oxygen in it and uh, it's, it's in an anaerobic environment. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the, this idea, just think of it as being uh, forever plastic and uh, last, uh, lasting a very, very long time. But uh, we need more scientific studies on this. Thanks. Thank you, thank you.